You're watching The Chaos Protocol on Transplanar RPG, an all-transgender, people-of-color-led, dark fantasy TTRPG show set in an original, non-colonial, anti-orientalist multiverse. If you like what you see, please consider pledging to our Patreon to support the show and get access to a patron-only after-show, early podcast episodes, GM notes, character sheets, and even the chance for your tabletop OC to cameo in our series. Thank you so much for watching, and enjoy! The Chaos Protocol is a dark fantasy series that may contain content that is triggering for some viewers. Content warnings for Arc 1 Episode 1 include fantasy violence, guns as weaponry, complex and complicated relationships, and references to fire, immolation, and death of loved ones. Arc 1 Episode 1 Moonlight Mourn Me The day the Chosen One dies. A world made of leaves erupts into flame, and the fire climbs so high it scorches the stars black. And there is no hope, and there are no tears, and there is no rage that could fill the void she leaves behind. You made your choice. Now I make mine. Brother, heed me as you ought. I won't mean it, I swear to you. Your heart will be the weight of mine plus scar tissue. Mentor, help me mend what's fraught. Braid my hair like you did hers, plant dust in my soul, and watch the ghost girl bloom. Lover, hold me when I'm gone. A path once tread is tread forever. The best time to say I love you is now. The second best time is never. We open on a moon, or rather, we open on a carving of a moon clasped between the stone fingers of a statue that holds it high above its head in worship, in rumination, in grief. This moon carving is pale, porous, its surface pockmarked with jagged crenellations, a perfect replica of the central moon in the perpetual eventide of Zhu Guang's night sky. The statue that holds this moon is 20 feet tall and marvelous, with flowing robes of storm gray stone and an expression somewhere between serenity and sorrow. This is the statue of Yin An, the moon god, worshipped by all in Zhiguang even beyond his demise. Everything about Yin An is Perfect, the soft lines of his jaw, the long, dark hair fanning out like a halo inverted, the regal, mournful gaze. Everything about Yin An is perfect except part of the moon he's holding aloft is missing. That's right, there is a broken off piece shaped like a crescent. Its absence creates jagged edges that bristle like the teeth of a demon. The statue of Yin An towers behind a shrine rich with offerings, silver ingots, plump sweet oranges, bitter tasting wine, lotus flowers. Stone pots flank the shrine, their ashen pits burning gray and red with fresh incense. Pillars of heavy wood support the curved, curved ribs of the roof, strips of vermilion paint peeling. Long, thin tassels of sutra paper dangle from the ceiling, inked with calligraphy from a bygone era. Before the Ascension War, the moon-kissed temple stood proudly atop Northern Wind Peak, overlooking the city of Zhao Yao like a lighthouse. Now, the temple simmers in ruin. 
Its eastern wall is collapsed, the gray light of Zhu Guang's everlasting night gasping through like an unwanted guest. But despite the war, despite the destruction, despite even the monster that lurks within the temple's sacred halls, this place is well kept. The rubble from the eastern wall has been moved outside, the floors are swept, the rafters are free of cobwebs, even the statue glimmers with recent offerings. The fruits are fresh, the wine unspoiled, even the gold looks hand-polished. This place of worship is broken, yes, but it is also loved by someone. The moonlight bleeding through the collapsed wall casts everything in a ghostly sheen, but the true denizen of this place is darkness. Shadows lurk in the dusty caverns of the ceiling, in the unseen places behind red painted pillars, and even the smoke that curls upward from the incense, smelling like orchids and camphor. And in the center of the Moonkiss Temple, under the watchful and impartial gaze of Yin An, a fight unfolds. Seir, Lumira, Zainan, and Sing, your shadows have been ripped from your bodies, given physical form, and imbued with violent intention. They lurk now before each of you, penning you in like wolves circling a shepherd's flock. These shadows are dark, writhing cutouts of you, inky silhouettes without faces or names. Your latest mission brought you here. You cannot fail again. Ying He, the shadeless, the monster of Zhao Yao, hunches before Yin An's shrine. Her hood is thrown back, revealing a face twisted with desperation and pain. Her light brown skin is pale, bloodless. Her silver eyes are glazed and pleading. Dark hair sticks to her brow, black lines creeping up her neck as liquid shadow fills her veins. Ying He's cracked lips tremble as he cries out. I told you to leave. I can't control them. Please, before I hurt you, even more than I already have. And now, I want each of you to tell me. Who are you? What do you look like? And how do you turn to face your shadow? Let's start with Sayer. Sayer is the party's combatant. He is the heavy front line, ready to take the punishment so that his compatriots might have an opening. And that is what he is doing right now. His bright blue eyes are locked against the dark abyssal eyes of his shadow counterpart. Crescent blade locked close against his, his heavy set body held taut against himself to just to try and defend himself from this. He staggers back his black and gold robes move past him as if a huge wave of wind has just hit him. He grasps, he gasps upwards and grunts through the pressure against his shadow and pushes and pushes his, uh, heavy, his bright uh, uh, shirt hiding a dark sun tattoo that glimmers like moonlight as he pushes further and further, locking his horns closer and closer, like a buck raiding himself for a new fight. As he murmurs to himself, this is really bad. Off, as he pushes further and further against his shadow counterpart with his crescent blade in hand and his shaggy hair covering most of his eyes. Mm, yes, Seir, the shadow that you're currently grappling with, like stags with horns interlocked, kind of power stances before you as a dark mirror of yourself. It's all muscle, all heft, all power, and your shadow wields these twin crescent blades just like you. They're identical, but there is one crucial difference, okay? You, Seir, you hold yourself like a thorny rose starved of light that's been forced to grow in the shadow of a bigger, brighter, more beautiful flower. 
But this version of you, this shadow sayer, does not. He holds his head high. His shoulders are back. His fists are curled around the hilts of his blades with perfect confidence. And as he punches his moon knives forward against you, black fire roars to life along one blade and black lightning sparks into existence along the other. This is a kind of magic that twitches, stirs something familiar within your gut. But that feeling is also so far away, you've never been able to reach it. And now, somehow, this shadow version of you is wielding it with such mastery. Your shade pushes forward and smashes into you with blades brandished in vicious delight. He hits you like a charging train. He breaks your stance and he slashes a sharp edge of his sparking blade across your chest. And on that flare of black flame, we whoosh across the temple to find Lumira. Who are you? What do you look like? And how do you turn to face your shadow? Lumira is the party's healer. She primarily is there for when those of her comrades take hits or get hurt in the line of action. She's the one who steps up to the plate to help. Um, so I think that's where you see Lumira. She's standing off over in the corner and she sees Sayer take this hit. Um, and you immediately see she stands at about uh, 5'10", 5'11", with this very lean but athletically built frame. Uh, this smooth brown skin that almost looks gold glimmered underneath. Um, she is dressed and pressed fine to the nines, and she carries herself with all the rigidity and poise of an archmage and body language and stature. But if you look closely at her, you can see in her eyes, she's wildly looking around, trying to pinpoint what part that she can get to that's safe enough to help those around. Um, her hair is kind of frizzy and all over the place at this point in time. It's almost this long, like kinky, curly brown hair that's ever so, ever so often is streaked with white that are it's going through in these gold uh, pieces that are attached. Some hair is left in its natural state and other pieces are braided. Um, <clears throat> and her robes are kind of billowing out behind her. Uh, and it almost, even in this darkness, the intricate golden embroidery of clock gears, every angle that she turns, the light kind of glimmers off of it. Um, and her earlobes are long and stretched with these gold plate gauges uh, that match the same uh, pattern of her uniform. And every so often she swishes, you can see underneath her cloak is a gold pocket watch, a vintage pocket watch that sits attached to her belt uh, and a diary notebook of some sort uh, that's also uh, attached to her waist. And when she sees Sayer take that hit, um, she looks up at her shadow counterpart and is looking for an opening. She's been training with trans for a long time now, almost all of her life almost. And she immediately, you see that gear switch on in her training where she finds that weak point and exploits that as she kind of swishes through uh, to circle around trying to make her way towards the air. Yeah, Lumira, uh, as you do, you see your shadow on the periphery of your own vision follow you as you switch to approach your teammate. Uh, she moves in perfect rhythm parallel to you. And at first, your shadow seems exactly like you if completely uh, filled with void. The robes, the hair, the kind of calculating presence of it. But as you peer closer, she stops mimicking your movements and starts acting on her own. 
your shadow clasps an arm behind her back in a perfect study of control. And with the other, she reaches into her robes and pulls out that pocket watch. That pocket watch you've carried for as long as you've been at the Syndicate, Lumira, but have never really used as part of your magical exploitations or studies because, well, it's broken. It doesn't tell time, it's simply a memento from a past you can't really remember because it was so long ago when you were so young, but that doesn't matter right now. What matters right now is before your very eyes, this shadowy version of you clicks the pendant on their shadow watch, and your heart stops beating. It doesn't hiccup, it doesn't jolt, it just stops beating. Pain shoots through your body as your blood slows down, your vision blurs, you feel sluggish, cold, breathing is difficult. Even as you stagger on the spot, something about your shadow feels so familiar. The flickering silhouette, the fuzzy boundaries of her face like a ghost caught in a dream, but then the pain flares. And on the spike of that pain, we punch to Zynan. Zynan, who are you, what do you look like, and how do you turn to face your shadow? In the throng of all of the scuffling and Lumira trying to make her play, a gold toe boot slides atop the temple floor and pivots very sharply as a lavender-toned hand reaches down and picks up a flat-brimmed black hat with a gold silk cord tied neatly around it. He places it atop his berry tone hair, short cut with very distinct graying around the face and over the ears. And it's very clear that this is not a young sprout, but the hat fits and he shifts and you see the fingerless gloved hand vanish inside of layers of beautiful light airy cottons that seem to glimmer in the moonlight the moon's light if you will it reaches in and he takes just a slight knee as the stock of a beautiful dark elm of a rifle mounts itself just under his arm from within the clothes and the whole thing in one swift motion pivots upward, revealing a long rifle with a uh, geometric cut um, of the metal and a gold single bolt action on it. Uh, just past where the trigger is, is a beautiful gold cord that matches the one on his hat. And it just hangs long over his otherwise black clothes that are only broken up by a dusting of gold and neon and he raises the rifle and puts his chin against it where his similarly toned berry stubble rests against the stock and a single neon green marking on one side of his face rests against it he closes his glowing green slitted eye just one to get a better sight as he looks down his rifle kind of thinking that his shadow is gone it's there's all these shadows everywhere why would it be here he's focused and raises the rifle to try and defend lumira and that zynan is your fatal mistake as you tear your eyes away from protecting yourself and fix it upon Lumira, we, but you don't see, but we, the audience, do, uh, spot Zynan's shadow uh, in his perfect blind spot. Your shadow is the same height as you. He has the same stature, the same hat, the same duster, the same rugged, coiled stance, like a punch ready to fly out. But unlike you, your shadow holds himself with ease, with the confidence of a gun that's never been jammed. He is muscle that hasn't scarred over yet. He is forest that has never known dust. He is you, but younger, braver, less lean, 
more teeth. And now you catch it, a flash of movement on your periphery, and I think as your instincts tell you to turn to look, there's danger, there's threat, you see your shadow turning to face you, squaring his hips in your direction, and he touches the brim of his own hat with, what is that, cockiness? And then, faster than your own eye can track, your shadow flashes into the folds of his own cloak and pulls out a mirror image of that bolt-action rifle. And a bullet of pure shadow explodes from the barrel. It punches into your shoulder with enough force to stagger you, a smoking trail of black mist rising from your cloak from where it hit you. And as you stumble and grunt from this blow, we cut now to the fourth and final member of Strike Team Nova, Sing. Sing is Sayer's twin. Identical to him in stature, build, skin tone, and the antlers that curve from her head, but different in literally every single other way that matters. Where Sayer is darkness, Sing is light. Where Sayer is violent, Sing is joyful, and where Sayer falters, Sing presses onward. Long white hair flows to their shoulders like a lion's mane. They are adorned with jewelry, a studded lip piercing, a septum ring, all kinds of chains and studs along their ears and horns. Sing wears a white robe over a low-cut black tunic cinched loosely at the waist by a golden sash. The right side of their chest sports a tattoo, a birthmark, an omen, identical to the one on Seir's torso, but the colors are inverted. For Sing, there is more light than darkness, more hope than despair. But the most striking thing about Sing is her eyes. Her eyes are a bright, violent shade of pink. There's something unexpected and dire about just how intensely pink they are, like a bloom of peonies in the mouth of a serpent's skull. Those are the eyes of someone with a purpose greater than just this one little unremarkable life. And indeed, Sing does have a greater purpose. Everyone knows it. Everyone on Strike Team Nova, everyone at the Syndicate, everyone she's ever met knows it, can sense it. Because Sing wasn't born. They were made. They were made by fate herself to serve a greater purpose. What that purpose is exactly is still a mystery to Sing, but they are fate's chosen. As for Seir... Well, everyone knows the story. After fate lifted Sing from the iridescent depths of the Prime Oracle, a second Sing also lifted from those depths a heartbeat late, blue-eyed, black-haired, and as silent as Sing was loud. Fate doesn't make mistakes. But as far as the Syndicate was concerned, Sayer is the closest thing to one. But this moment isn't about Sayer, it never is. It's about Sing. Sing brandishes her longsword, a gleaming silver weapon with a jet black hilt. She cuts forward like a charging stag and crosses blades with her shadow. Sing's shadow looks exactly like her as well, but the edges of its form are flickering, not with a glitch, not with static, but with flame. Tongues of black flame lick off the shoulders of Sing's shade, but Sing just laughs. She laughs. And unlike you, Sayer, unlike you, Lumira, unlike you, Zainan, Sing does not falter. Sing rises to the occasion and she shatters through it. They twist their sword under the shadow's blade, flick their wrist, and disarm the shadow. The obsidian blade spins through the air and then hits the ground. And Sing kicks the shade square in the chest, right in the sternum, the solar plexus, and it staggers backward, guard wide open. 
But instead of running after it, instead of pressing the advantage, instead of going for glory and victory, Sing reaches into the pockets of her robe and pulls out the crescent moon sigil, the broken off piece of the moon god statue behind the shrine. A beam of silver light is shooting from the center of this broken off piece and is pointing directly at the moon carving held above the god's head. And Sing dashes past their staggered shade and starts heading toward that statue. And without missing a beat, your own shadows begin to turn away. They break from the duets with each of you as their a new priority comes in, trying desperately to stop Sing. But Sing shouts over her shoulder at the three of you as she starts being pursued and as she's heading for that crescent moon statue. Strike Team Nova, cover me. And now I want to know... What do each of you do to stop your shadow and cover Sing? Let's start with Zynan. After reeling from that shot, Zynan sees the shadow move, and it's like both that inky blackness, but for Zynan, there is dust that trails behind it, and a sneer crosses his lips, and he just rewrites the rifle takes a very slow and deep breath, looks up at Sing, and pulls the trigger and hits his shadow in the back of the leg, like you would an animal. Mm, to wound it, right? To stagger it, to mm -hmm. make sure it can't come after her. Yeah, I think there's a noise as it shoots out from the barrel of your bolt action rifle and your aim is true. I think pain is burning in your shoulder from where your shadow pegged you, uh, but now that shadow, we see it stumble and stagger and kind of hit the ground with one knee. It limps forward briefly, but then glances over its shoulder, its eyeless form, face, falling upon you as you kind of like tip your hat at it, right? And you swear you hear your own shadow snarl. But even Can't in the gym- you just gym... say gone? <laughs> yeah, uh, Zynan, you say that. And as your shadow snarls at you, even in the growl, you hear something exuberant about its voice, about its presence, something youthful, something that you once had perhaps, but no longer. Now there's just- dust. Regardless, your shadow is now immobilized. Lumira, how do you cover Sing? So, Lumira is gripped with her heart stopping at the moment. And I think for a second, it really throws her off of her game before she feels the essence of the magic that stopped her and she doesn't understand it she doesn't understand why it's almost warm feeling to an extent it doesn't it it feels natural but unnatural at the same time and uh i think she lets that feeling kind of overtake her for a bit lets it fill her and then almost as if her magic her healing magic is almost like sh sugary syrup that's getting poured over all of it. She lets that overtake the rest of it. And when she realizes that if this is supposed to be me, then they also have my weak spot. And I think Lumera will turn to her left side. And as she's like kind of like on the ground, she pulls out out of her boots that are come up to like mid thigh. These boots are thigh highs, but she always, she always keeps that dagger on her. Uh, so she'll whip it out and get it, the shadow right in their left Achilles. Just. Oh yeah, you are a healer, Lumira, through and through a physician, uh, a mage of the body, mind and soul. You know how to, uh, you know how to heal people. You know how to help them. You also intimately know how to manipulate their own biology against them. You pull out your brute knife and you fucking gank your shadow. Bam! Right? Uh, there's no tendon, no muscle, no blood, no bone, no grist, no marrow, but there is 
heft. You feel the dagger stick into something. It's not just shade. And your shadow staggers. And just like Zynan's, uh, she kind of falls to the ground and drops the hand with that shadowy pocket watch. And you see the shadowy pocket watch fall out of her grasp and skitter across the floor. And then even while she's on the ground kind of crawling, your shadow makes a, a gesture with the hand that lost the watch. And then you see the watch uh, kind of like reverse itself through the air and land back in her hand. But for now, your shade is incapacitated. And now we cut over to Sayer. Sayer lands onto the wooden floors of the Moonkiss Temple, shattering the wood beneath him. His crescent blade lodged deep into the wood as he slams down chest downwards. And as his other half his better half effortlessly swings her blade to dispatch her foe with not even a second glance. There is a moment where his small lips curve into a, a prideful smile, but then his lion-like tail just swishes as she surges forward. There's something else that lingers underneath that, his eyes fixated on her ability, her effortlessness. Annoyance, bitterness, something there, and he just grips onto his crescent blade to lift himself up. Patience, patience, patience. As he gets up and holds his uh, blades, Sarah's going to do two things. He understands that now there are dozens of shadows going after his sister, his twin. She will succeed. And to do that, he has to cut the power at its source. He looks forward to seeing her, who is probably surrounded by uh, shadows. Uh, that is very interesting that you say that, Sayer. Yes. So the person from which these shades come is Ying He, the monster of the Moonkiss Temple, let's say, right by the shrine that Sing is, like, running toward. And she, this person, this hunkered, uh, hooded, but now thrown back, uh, outcast, essentially, from Zhu Guang, this kind of clutching herself in a pained, desperate, hunkered hug. And those black veins have crept all the way up to her face and are now like clouding her entire eyes from their usual silver to pure inky black. And she's letting out a, leave, just leave, just get out of here before I, I hurt you even more, even more, please. Uh, and those voices are coming out in pained gasps. And there's kind of like a pool of shadow by her feet where random, Shades will just come and oscillate out of it, like uh, predatory sharks jumping out of like a storm-tossed ocean. But you get the sense that he doesn't have any control over this. Uh, so that's the scene you see as you cast your gaze toward Yin Kua. There's a sinking feeling in Sayer's chest, a moment of familiarity and kinship that he witnesses on Yin Kua's face, that he looks at his shade who has gone darting off to sing. And he murmurs to himself, your mistake is forgetting me. And he will charge like a bull right at the back of the shade, push him over like a trained wrestler off to the side and charge directly at Ying He and try to clasp uh, his hands. Am I able to do that? So, yes, but you're gonna get hurt in the process. You're trying to, I'll like, body check your shade, who's just as big and tough as you. Uh, so I'll give it to you at that cost. As you slam into your double, you knock him off kilter, he falls to the ground, but not before uh, electricity and fire explode from that, like meeting like a clashing of two opposing magnets bam springing apart and you're not running toward ying he, but you're flung toward him rather and i think you're singed with black fire there's electricity static energy jolting through your nerves as you stumble and stagger up to this monster that works uh sayer's shirt 
was already torn. The white shirt that reveals his tattoo was already torn from the wound that he sustained earlier. Now incinerated through flame obsidian. And he clasps onto uh, Ying Her's hand. And in that moment calls out towards his compatriots, Lumira and Zainan. And he says, please buy us time. And he's going to hold Ying He's hands and say, look at me. Look at me. Don't think of anything else, please. Just look at me. Ugh, I can't. What are you? You're gonna get hurt. I can't. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. No, I can't. I, I'm not going anywhere. And I don't care if you hurt me. Just look at me. Us buying you time, Sayer. Is you staying alive? Ying He needs us. We cut the power of the source. Sing has an opening. As we got you. Speaking you of which, be right. as Ying He locks gazes with you, you see those inky pools of darkness, pleading, desperate, pained. Even as he's trying to push you away, she also needs you. She needs this connection. No one's ever reached out to her like this before. You intimate all of that through a glance because within her, you see a fragment of yourself, Sayer. And as your teammates call out, you know, kind of reluctantly, but agreeing to go along with this plan, Sing arcs into the air above your head, Sayer, and above Ying He's, over the shrine, and where she steps in midair, pink platforms crystallize beneath her feet, forming pedestals that go up, up, up toward the moon, clasped in the god's hands 20 feet up into the air. And Ling, uh, and Sing launches herself forward, the crescent sigil glowing in her hand, and she clicks the missing piece right into place. And as soon as she clicks it, moonlight explodes from the carving. Sing flies backward, the pink crystal staircase shatters into butterfly wings. And Sing catches herself on the landing, right? Knees bent, kind of like uh, skeetering backward on the temple floor, her eyes trained on the now glowing statue. And as that light sweeps outward, your shadow selves dissipate vanishing like mist before a rising sun. And the last shade to go is Sing's, with licking tongues of black fire sweeping it away. And bleeding into existence, so faint that its presence is barely more than just a suggestion, we see the outline of the moon god. He hovers above the shrine, robes flowing in an unseen, unfelt wind. His face is the color of moonlight, and his dark hair fans out behind him in a circular halo. Ying He, the shadeless, turns away from Yusayer and immediately falls to his knees in front of this god. Her cracked lips part in awe, she starts to bend to press her brow to the tiled floor of this temple, but then the moon god speaks. Rise, Ying He, steward of the moon-kissed temple, chosen priestess of my favor. Ying He raises her head, but she does not stand. There is an expression of shock on her face. She looks incredulous. In the glow of the moonlight radiating from this vision of this god, we see those black lines in his neck begin to fade and his eyes begin to uncloud. I, I, I don't understand. I was born without a shadow, cursed from the start, cursed to conjure shade out of nothing, to hold so much darkness inside me that I cannot control. I, how could I be chosen? Oh, blessed Yin An. What you call a curse, I call the blessing of my chosen, the knowledge of which was destroyed in the Ascension War, along with myself. But my ghost lives on. My memory lives on. The people of Zhiguang have the power to externalize your souls through shadow. 
That is how your magic works. Your shades walk beside you as physically realized fragments of your own heart. You lack a shadow, not because you are cursed, but because the power of your soul is so great that if it were to cast a shadow, it would blanket, it would blanket Zhu Guang in everlasting night. What? That's, that's terrible. So I am a monster, like they say. A blade can be used to kill. It can also be used to protect. Your blessing is powerful, that much is true, but the power is not the problem. It is your fear of it, my priestess. Your lack of confidence, your lack of control, and most of all, the hatred you have learned to hold for yourself. You are blessed with great power. Power you have been told your entire life is wrong. Wielded fearfully and shamefully, is it any surprise that your magic destroys? But wielded carefully, respectfully, with compassion and knowledge, you have the power to bring balance to a world ravaged by the Ascension War. Now that my sigil is restored, I can impart upon you the knowledge of the Ritual of Renewal, a sacred ceremony that will revive the ancient magic of this realm. Rise, my chosen priestess, and step into the destiny that was always meant for you! And slowly, reverently, Ying He rises to her feet. She looks at this ghost of her god in his eyes, and she sees within his face a fragment of her own soul, glimmering as silver as moonlight. The memory of Yin An reaches a hand down and cups the side of Ying He's cheek. The moonlight flares, and when it dies down, the moon god is gone, and there is a black halo behind Ying He's head like the shadow of a new moon. Ying He turns to face the four of you. Their cheeks are still hollow, their lips are still cracked, but a semblance of life is blooming, perhaps for the first time ever, in the silvery depths of their eyes. He addresses your party. I... I... I feel like a lake overflowing with power. I feel like for the first time in my life I know exactly what I need to do and how to do it. And it's all because of you. The four of you. You helped me figure out my purpose and, and now I have the power to help the city of Zhaoyao, to help all of Zhiguang recover from the war and forge a new path. Thank you. And as Ying He says these things to your party, what emotion rises to the surface for each of you, unable to be suppressed? Let's start with Lumira. Lumira is still reeling just a bit from all of this, but you, she tries so hard to keep the look of just pure content off of her face. Her eyes are very almost marble gray, opalescent to, an, uh, to a point, and they're wide in wonderment, wide in question, but also more specifically, like she rolls her shoulders back and stands up straight, kind of takes her normal pose She's proud that she was, we were able to prove ourselves this time. Mm. What about you, Zainan? What emotion rises to the surface for you? Hearing the fate of this divinely touched person 
Zainan can't help but look at Sing. And it's been a rocky journey thus far, but he smiles because this is why he's with Sing, why they are sent to work together. And there is a lot of satisfaction in seeing her succeed, in seeing this end. Mm. Yeah, I think on your look of satisfaction, we uh, follow your gaze over to where the twins are. Before we land on Sing, we're going to land on Sayer. What emotion rises to the surface for you? Throughout that transformation, that benediction that Yin He has received from Yin An, Sayer felt seen almost that someone like Yin He monstrous, reviled, cursed, bad mouth all of Zhe Guang felt found and chosen. He couldn't help but feel that too, like a moon reflecting the light of the sun. And he just smiles authentically as a tear falls down his left side of his cheek seeing that mm. Yin He has found a good path for them for himself. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a moment of like satisfaction and relief and yes, a little bit of victory being shared among Strike Team Nova here as Sing steps forward, like kind of dusts herself off, right? With a single flourish and pff, all the dust and the shadows are gone from her radiant robes. And she approaches Ying He. And even though she exudes radiance and joy and exuberance, there's something very down to earth about her expression as she talks to this chosen priestess. Hey, um, look, I know a thing or two about being chosen and all that, and it can be a lot of pressure, but it can also, like you said, be incredible when you know exactly what you're meant to do. So I'm really happy you found your purpose. I, I just know you're going to do amazing things to help your home. You're going to make Yin An proud. It's an honor to have helped you on that journey. And these words coming out of literally anyone else's mouth would have been kind of corny, would have been kind of cheesy, a bit overdone, fake. But coming from Sing, there is something special about them. A genuine weight. Like she's the first person ever to have spoken the sentiment aloud. And coming from Sing, it doesn't feel patronizing or trite. The words feel perfect. Ying He looks at Sing deeply and seriously, their silver eyes locking onto Sing's pink ones. And the chosen priestess of Yin An, monster of the moon-kissed temple, says, Thank you. I, I hope you find your purpose, too. I can sense you're still searching for it. It will come. And soon. Sing blinks, and for a second, we see a shard of vulnerability peering through. We see impatience, so much impatience. She's been waiting her whole life to know what her purpose is. We see longing, we see hope. <sighs> Thanks, priestess, I hope so too. I've been waiting for fate to show me what my purpose is my entire life, but I don't think the answers are just gonna come as easily for me as they did for you. I mean, it's not like the embodiment of destiny itself will just tell me who I am and what I'm meant to do. You know, I've made peace with the fact that I'm gonna have to figure it out myself. The embodiment of destiny? <clears throat> oh, that's that's just a turn of phrase. Uh, <laughs> as Sing goes on, that's when the four of you hear a beeping noise. 
Uh, not out loud, but in your heads, and it's consistent and it's very annoying. It is your strike team's oracle, your comms array slash database slash sapient magitech companion that accompanies you on every mission off world. And you hear the familiar beep, 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 and you know you're about to get teleported, zapped back up to the syndicate for a job well done. And the oracle's voice rings in each of your heads. Uh, <laughs> Uh, good, good job with the mission, everybody. A very standard God Prophecy Chosen One war stuff. It's time to go back to the Syndicate now, Strike Team Nova. Time for your debrief with Artemis. But more importantly, I am hungry and I want snackies. Uh, so what is the last thing each of you do or say before you get zapped back up to the Syndicate? Let's start with Zynan. Zynan as the... Uh, beeping, the very familiar oracle beeping starts even before our precious little baby oracle started talking. Uh, Zion began to fix his hat uh, and kind of dust himself off, even though it doesn't really all travel with us, but still it's habit. And uh, just lets out a very deep sigh, making sure that Singh does not continue to ramble too close to the truth. Mm, I think we pan over now to Lumira. Lumera is in the middle of doing a massive flourish. I think it's like a dust and a spin at the same time. So her cloak just like wraps around almost Zoro style and just straightens out her collar and rolls her shoulders back. Uh, and as she's is like, as soon as she hears that dinging uh, and straightens herself up, walks over to Sayer um, reaches into her cloak, like deep into one of her cloaks, pulls out like a like a stick of gum. Rest this on your tongue, and nice. will kind of like brush the dirt off the side of her shoulder. Uh, has um other side of her shoulders, uh, the entire thing. Don't spit it out like last time. Here. And then just that. focuses forward. <laughs> like in Speaking ready of which, <laughs> uh How's Sayer responding? What's the one thing Sayer does before you get zapped back up? Sayer, in that moment when he hears the beeping, his heart sinks a little. He thought he had more time. Um, and uh, as Lumira hands him the gum, he, his eyes glitter uh, as he smiles and replies to the mirror and promises. I have, I won't spit it out. I promise. I promise. Uh, Inka. I, I heal if you don't. I. I hope you can find your path now. It was nice meeting you. Thank, thank you. It was nice meeting you too. What are the four of you? Leaving? Yeah, we are. Okay then. Well, thank you for everything. And wait, I, I don't even think I caught your name. Oh, uh, my name is Sayer. And then light ensconces all four of you. The Moonkiss Temple vanishes, and you're back at the Syndicate. The Transplanar Reification and Nourishment Syndicate, better known to its undefined number of agents as trans, is not, materially speaking, real. The Syndicate's appearance is impossible to describe in detail. It has mass, that much we know, enough mass to span maybe a city, perhaps an atom's width, maybe a galaxy. The Syndicate is made of material, that much we also know. Uh, perhaps steel, or some kind of wood, or some kind of flesh, or a series of undiscovered elements overlapping like freshly laid bricks. Finally, trans is a location. That much we are mostly sure of. Trans is wedged somewhere above the crushing lurch of the journey, which is of course the ontological framework which undergirds all reality, and slightly below preceptual space, precepts being of course the omnipotent architects of the multiverse. Trans was founded by fate and magic, two of the three precepts, a few short heartbeats after they created reality itself. 
So the syndicate is, quite literally, older than time. And we push in now through the endless vacuum of semi-esoteric space, which is also a verdant field, which is also a collapsing star, and we enter trans. We see twisting halls of cosmic blue, oceanic purple, sterile white. The corridors are branching, interminable. A neural network of marble tile and long thin tubes of glowing ichor mounted to the ceiling, lighting the way like deep sea algae. Behind those thick oblong windows, those viewing bays, we glimpse an assortment of wondrous occurrences. Behind one window, machinery clanks and whirs, spinning fine filaments of steel thread into beautiful shapes. Behind another, plants grow in tandem with one another, feeding themselves, the soil, and the agents that care for them, their orange stems curling up bonewood trellises. We turn a corner and we enter a hall, a vast domed corridor, dozens of feet across and over a quarter mile long. Vaulted windows of prismatic glass offer a breathtaking view of a sunny ocean with waves of cosmic purple. The glass shimmers and the view changes to a bustling city. There is another shimmer and we see a desolate ice field. This vista is constantly changing, never static, always magnificent. The hallway itself throngs with activity. Agents of trans bustle in every direction, sporting flowing robes and cybernetic tech wear, and holograms and silk boots and mechanical limbs and wings and horns and tails and claws and teeth and eyes and fur and skin and scales and hooves and feet and faces. The people of trans are every form imaginable, every size, every shape, every possibility of life that has ever glimmered within the infinite horizons of the journey. We now see a person with dark blue skin and a tunic of shimmering interlocking scales hustling past a wall with the trans logo on it. And the logo is a light blue circle with three spheres of white forming a triangle inside of it. 16 stars shine along the inner edge of the circle along with thinner bands of pink and white. Strolling past the trans logo in the other direction is an agent with light brown skin and curly dark hair adorned with live moss and flowers that bloom before your very eyes. Z is shuffling between various papers, holograms, and documents as Z bustles down the hallway with a golden mechanical cat trotting alongside them. And this agent walks parallel to the iron tracks that cut through the center of this hallway. The ground shakes, and a train roars down this track made of gleaming black iron. An agent sticks Fair Head out the window, golden braids whipping against Fair Dark Skin. Faye grins and waves at the agent with the cat, who waves back with a handful of papers not really looking. And then Z trots toward the train with Zier Cat and phases through it perpendicularly, reaching a rest stop on the other side. And we follow the train now, rumbling down this track, rainbow steam bu billowing from the vents on its black plated roof. And as this train approaches the end of the corridor, the shuttle slows down, wheels groaning against bright steel tracks. And the train chugs slowly under a splendid gateway, a threshold of marble and horn. Paper lanterns, wooden tiles, and other blessings dangle from the archway as the train pulls to a stop just past it. The doors slide open, ramps file down, and agents come pouring out into Concourse B. And we now see Concourse B, a massive, sprawling plaza that's easily the size of a town, maybe even a city. Multiple levels overlook a ground floor of tessellated tiles, gardens, and even gurgling streams that splash over grassy hills and pass under rock bridges with stone lions guarding them. The ceiling, if you can even call it that, is an open expanse of bright blue sky with fluffy white clouds drifting past twin suns that shine warmly. 
We see fountains of emerald water, buildings of sandstone and wood, even temples of all shapes and sizes honoring deities from a plethora of worlds. Concourse B is one of the Syndicate's many beating hearts, a central atrium where all dis where agents from all disciplines pass through and converge. And we see these agents now, consulting hollow screens, pushing dollies, wheeling cages full of strange, whirling energies. Trans is a place of enchantment. It is a place of wonder. It is a place of fate and magic. We hold now on this concourse, watching the ebb and flow of daily syndicate life. And then, Ringing through the PA systems in every corridor, every chamber, every oracle of the Syndicate, the announcement comes. And this announcement changes everything. Sayer, Lumira, Zainan, and Sin. The four of you materialize on the teleportation dais in briefing room. The room looks exactly as you left it, an oblong chamber with a rectangular window built into one wall. This window, as it always does, overlooks a vast expanse of night sky, the stars glimmering like precious gems in the depths of a long forgotten ocean. There is a table in this room, several chairs, a floor of polished hardwood. Briefing room eight isn't fancy necessarily, but it gets the job done. An apt descriptor of all strike teams who work under Artemis, patron saint of mortals, one of the three hands of fate who run the syndicate. But as you appear in briefing room eight, you can all immediately tell that something is wrong. Artemis isn't here. This is extremely unusual. This is borderline, like, alarming or, like, need for emergency. The hands are always there to debrief their strike teams when they return from mission. But it's not just Artemis' absence that strikes you as odd. The sliding door that opens up into the hallway is ajar. You can hear and you can see people running past the door, shouting, gesturing. There's some kind of massive commotion happening. What do the four of you do? Zynan actually holds a hand out and is going to go to the door slowly, but is trying to hold everyone back for just a second to see what's going on. Thayer, like, looks, uh, like, nods at Zynan's uh, instruction and has his hand on one of his crescent blades and kind of looks at Lumira and Sing, and it's just like, Artemis is always here. So Artemis never leaves a door ajar. It's either open or it is shut. Something is very clearly wrong. Did you eat that strip? It's going to take so much Lumira. longer to heal you, Sayer. No, I'm still chewing it. Sing peels past all of you and, like, past Zaiden's outstretched hand, like, just brushes past nope. it. And yep, she's there. She opens up the sliding door and peeks her head outside. Hello? Hey, what's going on? What's happening? And she's addressing this to the various people running down the hallway, just like gesturing and shouting and moving very quickly. The mirror and will walk I, out too, like yep. out into the hallway. <laughs> just <laughs> Sarah will look at Zaiden and it's just like, Zaiden just shrugs. <laughs> it's all right, let's go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think as the three of you catch up with Singh right by the uh, threshold, you see into the hallway and you notice that the doors to the other briefing rooms in this corridor are also open and various strike team members are pouring out of them. They're pulling on coats. They're running down the hallway in the direction of the concourses. There is an energy in this space, a hectic, chaotic energy, tension and anxiety, excitement and fear, hope and wariness. And as each of you kind of like poke your heads out of briefing room eight, a short, stout agent in an electric wheelchair with dark skin and shoulder length, curly black hair, uh, nearly collides with all of you, with Singh in particular, who's like now in the middle of the hallway, like trying to get people's attention. Um, and this agent very deftly navigates her chair around your group and while still kind of rolling down the hall, but at a reduced pace, addresses your party. What are the four of you still doing here? Didn't you hear the announcement? Didn't your oracle tell you? Never mind. Fate 
and magic are here. They've confronted oblivion. They have some kind of news to share. Everyone, everyone is coming to hear the news, even strike teams who have been on mission for years. They're recalling them. The hands are breaking protocol, come on. Click, 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 click. Lumira is dead sprint down the hallway. You just hear her boots. Lumira, wait. Uh, uh, he kind of like looks over to Zyna and it's just like, we got it. Zynan is kind of frozen for just a moment. I think another agent just brushes past him, and usually he is quick to move out of someone's way, even if he can't see them. And he's a bit stunned. And, Sir, I think you draw him back to the present. Sir? We, well, you heard them. We gotta go. Yes, sir. Come on. Sing is right there with you, Lumira. Like she immediately started running as soon as like, as soon as the words fate and magic and oblivion fell out of the person's mouth, she, she was gone. She was there. Yeah. <laughs> the both of us just darted immediately yep. down the hallway. Yep. Uh, so the four of you just dart down this hallway. You go past the gate, down another hall, twisting and turning through the ever changing corridors of trans. You can never quite take the same path twice until you arrive in concourse B. The plaza is the fullest you have ever seen it. Every square foot is packed. The balconies, the ground floor, even the floating daises of gardens and rest stops above your head, every single one of them is packed with syndicate agents. And in the center of Concourse B, levitating just underneath the field ops leaderboard, is a stage. A vast floating platform that is currently empty, save for the three hands of fate. We see them now, huddled in a corner of the stage, talking furiously amongst themselves. The first hand of fate that we see is Wu Yin, patron saint of heroes. He is a seven foot tall man with muscles that could cut glass. He has light brown skin and long dark hair, the color of obsidian schooled into a loose bun at the top of his head. His face is a perfect mix of masculine softness and feminine fierceness. The strike teams under Wu Yin's command have a sterling reputation of excellence, strength, and of course, heroism. Wu Yin is wearing Tai usual getup of dark lacquered rawhide armor with gold trimmings and deep emerald plate. A gold carving of a lion's head is mounted on Ta Wright's pauldron, and strung across his back is a long, beautiful guandao, a polearm with a curved blade of pure jade. Wu Yin's usually very cheerful, very exuberant face is scrunched in worry and concentration as Ta consults with the other two patron saints. Ta the dark eyes flick over to the second hand of fate. Lucy. Lucy, the patron saint of monsters, has a sharp, severe face and dark, deep magenta skin. Standing just shy of six feet, her build is deceptively slender with reams of hard muscle rippling underneath. Her perfectly tailored black vest with a golden tie against a starched white collar. Over the vest, they wear a black cape shimmering with bright fire. A pair of horns spirals from their brow, resting above eyes of pure black with bright crimson pupils. Lucy's hair is long, black, and straight, slicked back up over their forehead and left to tumble carelessly across their shoulders. Lucy wears all kinds of jewelry on their face, horns, and sharp spade-tipped tail. Lucy's brow is dark, uh, expression currently concentrated right now, but her face is otherwise unbothered. She leans in to the third hand of fate, mouth moving with some kind of suggestion. And now we see Artemis, the patron saint of mortals, a broad-shouldered, heavily muscled butch person with light skin, a completely shaped head, and sharp golden eyes that don't quite fit the rest of their face. 
A tattoo of laurel leaves curves around their head, framing a network of concentric circles at the back of her crown, and she wears a black and gold sleeveless shirt with a sheer white shawl thrown over one shoulder. Their faces hard, impossible to parse, mouth set in an unmoving line and a lip piercing gleaming on the bottom lip. Of all the hands, Artemis's uniform is the most understated, though they do exude a presence of great import. Artemis takes in what Lucy is suggesting, though we don't hear it, and she lets out a deep sigh. And then Artemis, Lucy, and Wuyin put their hands in the middle and they play rock, paper, scissors. Uh, and we see Artemis throw rock, and Lucy and Wuyin both throw paper. And Wuyin kind of with that open outstretched palm claps Artemis on the back. Lucy smirks and Artemis <sighs> sighs again. And Artemis turns to face the crowd above and below them. Then they stride to the front of the stage. And as soon as she does, the murmuring stops. The tension in Concourse B is palpable. The excitement, the fear, the stress, the confusion, the hope. And then Artemis opens their mouth and addresses the crowd. Agents of trans, the announcements from your oracles are true. Fate and magic are here. As all of you know, we have been looking for the third precept, Oblivion, for as long as the Syndicate has been around. Oblivion is the most dangerous entity in the journey. She annihilates anything and everything she comes into contact with. She is the darkness at our heels, the shadow in the wood, the end of all things. And one of our sacred duties as the agents of the Transplaner Reification and Nourishment Syndicate is to vanquish her. The Twilight Guard, our highest ranking strike team, have served as our stalwart leaders in this objective. And on that, Artemis nods at one of the deities floating near the stage, and we see four figures atop that dais, but at this distance, you can barely make out their silhouettes. Even so, these figures wave at the audience below who let out a huge cheer. The Twilight Guard, led by Wu Yin, are heroes among heroes, the best of the best, the most legendary strike team trans has to offer. Artemis returns to addressing the crowd, which falls silent immediately under her gaze. The search for oblivion is over. Three hours ago, fate and magic confronted, confronted oblivion on a plane of existence known as Andake. There was a great battle, many lives were lost. And at the end of it, well, Fate and magic have returned to the Syndicate to explain the rest themselves. This is an unprecedented moment, but I trust you will give them your fullest attention. Trust in her will. There is a noise, like gemstones singing, like trees breathing prayer. Like the ocean striking a match, there is a sensation like falling, like flying, like hurtling through infinite horizon on the back of a flaming comet. There is a taste like honey, like copper, like the sugary tang of a prophet's tear. And then, ribboning into existence in a flurry of butterfly wings, rose petals, and iridescent light, our fate and magic. Magic wears a shimmering iridescent robe that looks cut from infinite realities. The material is fine, like silk or grains of sand. The color of the robe refuses to stay static. It constantly shifts, like the views here at Trans, like shadows at the bottom of the ocean. Magic's face is soft and angular like a weapon made of gold. Their eyes are every color at once and so is their hair. Long and flowing and braided and never ending. You can't quite tell where their hair stops and their robe begins. His skin is dark, 
the color of a storm-tossed sea. And standing in front of magic is fate. Fate has a round, bright face like a parhelion ring. Their skin is gold. Her hair is short, dark. She wears a long, fluid dress of pure incandescent light. Every single person in the audience instinctively shields their eyes, yourselves included, but the light doesn't hurt. You have a feeling it could, if fate wanted it to, but it doesn't. Fate has short, soft fingers that lift into the air and wave as she addresses the crowd. A dazzling smile cuts across Fate's face, and then she steps forward, floating in the air, not quite touching the dais, and addresses the audience. Her voice also floats. It levitates somewhere between your mind, your soul, and it wraps itself warmly, gently around the very core of your being, like reams of red thread. This is not a creation story, and these are not gods. Before there was nothing, there was everything, the first precept. They knew the beginning, and they knew the end, and they called themselves fate. Before there was everything, there was nothing, the first precept. She knew the end, and she knew the beginning, and she called herself oblivion. They loved each other. They hated each other. They were nothing to each other, and they were everything to each other. Then came something, the third precept. They didn't care about the beginning or the end, and they called themselves magic. Magic sprang forth, strong and coiling, iridescent and dark, structured and formless. Everything invited something on a journey, and together they left. And on their way they made life and death, water and fire, luck and love, time and change, everything, everything. Gods, worlds, realities, outcomes. Oblivion watched as fate and magic journeyed, and it grew jealous, and it grew resentful. And when it followed their trail, oblivion destroyed. It destroyed realities. It subsumed time. It ate life after life, world after world. Fate and magic saw that oblivion was darkness, and the darkness needed to be stopped. And so, Fate and magic journeyed and journeyed, seeking oblivion so they could one day end the ending itself. And after an infinity, and after no time at all, thanks to a handful of demigods and a very lucky sword, fate and magic finally found oblivion. And we worked things out! That's right! Uh, oblivion has been stopped for good. We sat down, we had a nice long chat, we explained our perspective, and we finally convinced Oblivion to change her ways. So Magic and I have decided that no one has to die and everyone deserves a second chance. Right? Oblivion has always been, uh, what's the mortal term? Like, uh, like a sibling to me, yes. A, a terrifying sibling, yes, the embodiment of the inevitable end of the multiverse and everything we know, but a sibling, nonetheless. I have always loved Oblivion, and I know, I know, that with just a little bit of guidance, we can help her become a better precept. Why, we've already rewritten the rules of reality, so she has room to grow. With our help, Oblivion can learn to stop destroying universes willy-nilly. She can be better. And Magic and I, in our infinite wisdom, can help her. 
So I know what you're thinking. What does this mean for us? What does this mean for trans? As we all know, since the syndicate's inception, your primary objective has been to help me enact my will across the multiverse, to help ensure that what is fated comes to pass. And trans's secondary objective, of course, has been to find Oblivion so we can lock her away forever, but again, no longer relevant. So starting right now, Syndicate agents have a brand new primary objective. Oblivion has destroyed so many planes, so many multiverses, so many of my faded stories that she can't possibly fix it all by herself. So we're going to help her and the multiverse together. After apologizing for all she's done wrong, Oblivion pointed me in the direction of uh, what do we call these? Distress calls generated due to her presence. And now I bestow upon all of you your new directive. Mayday missions. That's right. Field agents will not be answering these distress. Field agents will now be answering these distress calls to get those broken worlds back on my fated path. I understand that some of you may have complicated feelings about the Syndicate's new direction. After all, many of you have lost loved ones to oblivion itself. Some of you have even lost more than just loved ones. Entire worlds, entire planes of existence. Oblivion is not innocent. Far from it. I'm not claiming that she is, but everyone deserves a second chance. Trans is about doing what's right. Trans is about enacting my will, not just because I said so, but for the good of the multiverse itself. Every mission I've sent you on serves a greater purpose. Even if you don't understand the objective immediately, I know they've been odd, Dig a hole here, move a statue there, bump into this person on this random plane, but your missions create incredible outcomes, as your debriefs prove. Digging that hole might have created just enough room for a tree of life to sprout. Moving that statue could have shifted the entire alignment of a temple just so to prevent a terrible collapse. Bumping into that person could have helped them meet the love of their life. What incredible stories! Trans is not about vengeance. Trans is not about rage. Trans is about helping other people. I understand your pain. As the architect of all reality, your worlds are literally my world. Your pain is literally my pain. But killing Oblivion won't bring back the universes they've already taken. It won't bring back your loved ones. What has been taken by Oblivion, as we all know, can never be returned. But what will make you feel better, what will make a positive difference in the multiverse, is helping those who have been hurt by Oblivion. Extending a loving hand. Healing the multiverse. This is our destiny. This is our fate to repair a reality that's been torn apart by Oblivion's mistakes and serve as the stewards of a better journey for all. And on that, we cut to the four of you, Seir, Lumira, Zainan, and Singh. The crowd, which has been silent through this entire speech, no one dares interrupt fate. Who could, even if they tried? The crowd now rises up in a great big cheer. Even those who were sitting in shocked silence before, those who have lost people, lost loved ones, are clapping, they are cheering, they are whooping, they are crying and shouting and pumping their fists. And as we find you in the audience, I want to know what emotion flashes across your face at this world-shaking pronouncement, starting with Lumira. Lumira came into this so excited. So enthralled, she believes wholeheartedly in fate's plan. She genuinely trusts in her will. But she could not 
hide her face dropping, the more fate brought up second chances for oblivion. She is one of those people that lost everything. It does not seem fair. Do what I lost get a second chance? So while everyone jumps up and cheers, she stays seated for a second and looks extremely solemn before she realizes where she's at and what presence she was in. She gets up to her feet and starts clapping. Mm. Lumira, as you start clapping as you should, uh, we pan across next to you to find Zidon. What emotion flashes across your face, your face at this pronouncement? Fate is uh, not the most present uh, uh, before this very moment, and Zynan has been here for going on a day or a decade, depending on how you measure time, and has never been in their presence. And so they were ready, he was ready to be just in awe, and was for quite a while, and as the pronouncement truly came out, Zainan felt like he was at the bottom of the darkest hole. The sound in the room vanished for a minute, and I think he did not hear huge sections of what this precept, the person that when he closes his eyes, he thinks, I'm going to do her will. He couldn't hear her. And then he pulled himself back like he does every time. And as the final issuing of the order for the Mayday calls comes through, by that point he is present. And unlike Lumira, is on his feet with everyone else and writes his hat and begins to clap and cheer, but it is a little hollow. Mm. Yeah, I think as you clap alongside Mumira, we now cut over to Seigneur. As we find your face in the audience, I wanna know what emotion flashes across your expression at this world-shaking pronouncement? Ambivalence, uh, like, a child who's heard a story one too many times. Seir was made in trance alongside his chosen twin sister. He was made by fate. He was molded by her. And then never really saw her again. And all the stories, everything that he has learned, he's learned from the people here about fate, about magic, about oblivion about oblivion and their disasters their impact their danger to everyone else but that's all he's known oblivion's always just kind of been that a story a boogeyman someone that everyone else is afraid of yet is too frightened to really get real about so he isn't really reacting to the story of Oblivion. But there's one person on his mind. One who he knows Oblivion has taken much from. And his bright blue eyes glitter over to Lumira. As she is sat down and he is also sat, hands kind of clutching his thighs, watching looking at her, sharing a look of, hey, I'm here for you. I see you. And as soon as she feels confident to rise, whether or not she meets his gaze or not, he also gets up and does a small clap. Mm. 
Yeah. Sayer, as you join the rest of your strike team in clapping, we now pan across your faces to find Sing. Sing, this entire time, has been hanging on to every single syllable coming out of Fate's mouth like they are golden kernels. And right now, Sing's eyes are full of stars. There is something monumental. There is something monumental in Sing's gaze, something vast and unreachable. She isn't clapping or cheering like the rest of you, but she's just nodding slowly and confidently, and her eyes are fixed on fate. And we pan back up to the stage now as fate smiles, does a little curtsy, does a little bow at the clapping, and goes on to say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. But you, all of you, you are the real heroes of this story. You will be the ones responding to these distress calls after all. In the meantime, Magic and I will be going on a journey of our own. A much needed journey of self-discovery and recentering and renewal as we figure out the best way to guide Oblivion into this new version of himself. So I'm afraid we can't quite stick around, but before we leave, there is one more thing I need to address. Let's see. Sing. My chosen one. Come up here and join me on stage. And at that, there is a collective gasp. The crowd shifts. They kind of like stop and they're clapping to, to turn. And every single eye fixes on your party, specifically on Sing. And Sing is as still as a statue. Her pink eyes are wide. Her face is cracked open like breaking dawn. And then she gathers herself nods once, firmly, and without looking back at the three of you, without looking back at Seir, her twin, Sing steps up into the air, and a dais of translucent pink glass crystallizes underneath her feet, step by step, as she approaches the stage above her, weaving a staircase out of thin air. Sing's steps are calm. She is not nervous, she is focused. Sing moves like someone who knows exactly what's going to happen next. And when Sing finally arrives on the main stage, they hesitate at the edge as though shy to approach fate. But the precept, everything, smiles down at Sing with that perfect immaculate smile and Sing nods and steps forward to join her. And fate turns her smile back to the audience and speaks. It's about time I share with you and everyone at Trans what your true destiny is.